Now, in 1958, that was actually kind of before, at the beginning of the GoFi stream, but this was kind of subculture and actually proposed from a psychological point of view. There was the first neural network proposed. Actually, there were earlier ones, but the first uh, one that connects to the current developments called the perceptron. And it was drawn like this. Uh, the circle could be considered to be an artificial neuron, and these arrows are inputs. And these inputs represent uh, numbers, it could, be, for instance, be uh, that you have three numbers, x1, x2, and x3. These are numbers that represent a client for a bank, for instance. And x1 could represent the age, x2 the number of children, and x3 the salary. And these were all added up and summed in this neuron. But these arrows that you see, they have a weight. So if the number of children is more important or the salary is more important for the ultimate decision, you could weigh this input. And this is not something you do manually, but you can automatically train the system to weigh these um, uh, inputs on the basis of the output that it's giving. So a very simple task is if you have a bank and you want to decide if you want to give somebody a loan, you could just uh, collect a lot of data and decide whether somebody should have got a loan or not. So you have the kind of ground truth. And then you check for all these clients um, if the perceptron would give the right answer. Now, initially, these arrows have random weights. But it was shown in 1958 already that you can change this um, uh, by using a, an automatic learning procedure in such a way that it would give, in most cases, the correct output. Now, for those of you who know statistics or work with statistics, this is a kind of neural metaphor for logistic regression. And of course, um, uh, that happens a lot in this field that you have these uh, mystifying terms like neural networks for things that are actually very well known. But in these days, it was revolutionary because it, it made a connection between the idea of a neuron in the brain and um, this learning system, artificial learning systems. Now, now I jump to 1980s and like uh, these times. So on the left, you see the 1980s versions of stacked perceptrons, where you take a lot of these perceptrons and stack them in layers. And this was uh, what I worked on in the 1980s and many other people. Um, and you could have a kind of input layer where the inputs were, like these, these characteristics of a client. And you had a hidden layer where were neurons that could comp uh, compute complicated functions that you needed to comp compute an output layer. So these neural, neural networks in the 1980s, uh, developed by people like Jeffrey Hinton and others, uh, were able to uh, solve more complicated tasks and better able to make predictions, for instance, for this uh, bank application, if you want to decide if you should go give somebody a loan or not. Well, in the 1980s, there was also a person called Jan Le Kun who developed a, a deeper system and applied that to zip code recognition. It was very successful, so that's 30 years ago. Um, and, um, uh, but we also tried to build these systems to recognize these images of my dog and other, uh, well, I didn't have that dog then, but other dogs then. And that didn't work. So uh, people thought these neural networks failed. So that took a long time until now where we have these deeper neural networks and now we can automatically classify images and train the system on automatically labeling images. The only provision is that you need a lot of data and you need a lot of these arrows that you see, these connections. All these connections that you see here, and this is of course a caricature, but these connections are adaptive. So it's a sequence of steps that you go through this neural network and each of these steps transforms the information up to the end until it gives the right answer. If it makes a mistake at the output, you have a special algorithm that propagates backwards to the network and changes all these connection strengths until you have the correct configuration of connections. Now, what changed between these two steps? The first is that we have much more data now. So the fact that these 1980s things didn't work was you had a lack of data, but also a lack of computational power because to, to create a very deep network, you need a lot of computational power. And there are also some machine learning innovations that help there. But actually, the neural networks that we have today or the bulk of the neural networks were already available 30 years ago. But because of the lack of data and computational power, they didn't work that well. 
Now, this is to intimidate you, but especially to show you that the thing on the left, which is a neural network, is fully understood. On the right, for those of you with a mathematical knowledge, it's, it, there's no, it's fully transparent in the sense that we know how these neural networks are uh, connected. The point is that, like with this pattern recognition of these elephants in this shadow, is that all these connection weights, it's not like if-then rules. It's kind of distributed over this whole network. So it's very hard to explain how it arrives at its output. But it's not that we do not understand what happens in the neural network. So it's a, not a mystery. It's just how to interpret it, what it makes it difficult. Now, an intuitive notion of what these neural networks are doing, and this applies to all these deep learning networks that we nowadays see, is that you have a big black box, not so black, a bit gray, because there's some transparency there, with a lot of knobs. You put something in, you look at the output, is it correct? You do nothing. If there's a mistake, you start changing these knobs. And of course, if you had to do that manually, that would be very difficult because the number of knobs on modern neural networks are in the millions or more. But we have a very straightforward algorithm for that, which is very well known in optimization. And it's called uh, gradient descent. And it's just following by each time changing the knob a bit in the direction that minimizes the chance of making an error. And this is called backpropagation. And this algorithm is also known for 30 years and maybe a bit longer even. Now, there are nice videos. I always show that if you want to know more about how these things work, go to three blue, one brown, which are YouTube videos that explain, give some intuitive explanation of how these networks work. Also for the, uh, the learning procedure. But I skip that now because that takes too much time. Now, this is what we had about 10 years ago. We had networks that could be trained on about thousands of images of dogs of different breeds, including my dog, or the breed of my dog, shown on the left, which is a Samoyed. And by training the system, uh, you were able to, uh, after training the system on all these thousands of instances, and these were labeled, so you need thousands of ins instances of Samoyeds, of Papillons and Pomerani. I know, don't know all these breeds, but after that, the system is able to automatically label a new image of a dog and indicate what the breed of the dog is. And the way this network is doing that, it's exploiting anything in the input that helps it to predict it. So I always give the example, suppose that all these Samoyeds were uh, depicted in a white background because they come from Siberia, then the snow in the background, the white background, could also be used as a cue. That has nothing to do with the dog, but this system doesn't know. It's what we call greedy. It uses anything in the input it can use to predict that this dog is a Samoyed. So that means that the quality of the data should be such that there's, there's also variety in the backgrounds because otherwise the network will pick up these features that have nothing to do with the dog. And this applies to image classification, but actually for all machine learning tasks. Now, there are also systems uh, 10 years ago that could be trained on images with captions, and then they could automatically generate uh, a caption, the description. So this is from a system that was trained on millions of images with captions, and then it was confronted with this image. The first part of this network was uh, a vision network, like for the dog. And the second is a network that is trained on sequences, on generating descriptions. And as you see this description, it looks as if the system understands the picture. Well, this is 10 years ago. Now we have GPT-4 that's even better in this respect. So it's better able to label these images and even describe them in a way that seems to um, suggest that it has uh, an understanding of the picture. Now, a small thing about the internal uh, structure of these neural networks. As I said, it's hard to interpret them, but for some domains, for instance, the visual domain, you can inspect the inner workings of the network. So the, here you see three layers of a network that is trained on a face recognition task. And what you see is actually the sensitivities. What are the features or the visual aspects that these neurons that have been trained by using this procedure uh, that they detect in the images. And what you see at the first layer, it looks at contours, oriented contours. An uh, intermediate layer, it looks at small configurations in the face. And on the top layer, you see kind of face detecting neurons. And, um, and what I'm now saying you should be take very carefully because it can be misunderstood easily. A similar strategy is used by the visual system. If you ask anybody who studied the visual system, you see neurons in the first stage that look like this, so-called edge detectors. And in the middle layer, you see these kind of configurations. And at the top layer, we have neurons that respond to individual faces. 
And um, that's just not to say that these neural networks are as complex as the human visual system, because they're not. They're much simpler. It's only that the general solution strategy is very similar to what we see in, in, in biological visual systems. And this system was not programmed. It was only programmed on predicting the correct label. In this case, I think it was a gender recognition task. Uh, and nothing else. So it has no knowledge about eyes or nose. It doesn't understand noses or eyes. It's just using the pixel values to make this prediction. Now, this is one form of uh, neural networks. There's another form, which is called reinforcement learning. And this is an example of reinforcement learning. Two uh, pigeons are at either end of a small ping pong table. One pigeon uh, pecks the ball. So these are pigeons playing ping pong. Other pigeon, other pigeon pecks the ball back across the table. If it goes past one pigeon, the other pigeon can eat. And if it goes the other way... The so other now he wins and he gets something to eat. So you reinforce, you, you reward pigeon, uh, the pigeon that scores a goal. And in this way, they learn to acquire the skill of playing uh, ping pong. This is very old. This is uh, psychological uh, research by Skinner a long time ago, which gave rise to a whole um, stream of what is called behaviorism in clinical psychology, but also in cognitive science. Um, but there's a variant in deep learning. It's called deep reinforcement learning, and it's used for uh, creating oh, for creating action. Oh, this is, unfortunately, the video doesn't work because we had to change to PowerPoint. But the idea is that the one of the hardest tasks for uh, autonomous drones is to fly in un, uh, unstructured environments like a forest. And they succeeded by using deep reinforcement learning, which is just a variant where you reward the neural network if it performs a good action or a good sequence of actions and punish it otherwise. This is called policy learning. Um, they were able to have this drone flying uh, very noise, uh, under noisy circumstances through forests. And this is, of course, uh, one of the spin-offs in many military domains nowadays. Now, what is important to realize is that if we think about science, there's one important principle in science, and it's called Occam's razor. So if you want to explain a phenomenon that you don't understand, or you want to model something in a statistical model, you should not overfit the data. And overfitting means that you have too many free parameters. So these knobs that I showed you in these neural networks uh, are all free parameters, things you can change. But if you want to model something, you should reduce the number of parameters. Otherwise, you get overfitting, as shown on the left, the red curve, which the complexity of this curve is based on the number of parameters, is too large because it's fitting the noise. Actually, the, the curve on the right seems to capture the, the, the proper structure. So this is not only true for statistics, but also in science. If you see something flying in the air that you don't recognize, you do not start with an elaborate theory about that the aliens arrived. You try to come up with something simpler, which doesn't require so many assumptions. It's a basic principle of science. And as you can see on the bottom right here, that, that's what good scientists do. They reduce the number of parameters. But AI researchers um, are more like pirates. And they um, just explored uh, what the effect was of increasing the number of parameters. And that's what they're doing in deep learning. All these knobs on these systems is something that any statistician dreads, because that's not what you should do. But somehow, the uh, what is called overparameterization, to use many parameters, is part of the secret of this deep learning success. Now, this principle is now translated into so-called language models. So the idea that you use a lot of parameters, and one of the problems of traditional machine learning and deep learning was that you needed all these images of the dogs, all these examples, but also the labels. Now, what they came up with is a form of learning which is called self-supervised learning. And if you have tons of text, for instance, you can use self-supervised learning by giving them part of the sentence and ask a system to predict the next word. That's one variant of self-supervised learning. So that means that you only need data and the label is kind of intrinsic to the data. And in this way, you can train the system on huge data sets like the whole World Wide Web, Twitter, books, etc. And um, what is the tendency is a growing number of these free parameters. And that's what we saw in the past. And of course, this is uh, al already leading to a lot of concern about the energy requirements, which is not always um, a very balanced discussion, but uh, it might be temporary because there are developments here. And this is a uh, kind of overview of what happened in the number of um, 
parameters if you just look at the GPT systems. I could have included GPT 3.5 here, but I don't remember what the number of parameters were. But the idea is that it's growing. Now, the, the funny thing is that we don't know how many parameters GPT 4 has, and they're not very open about it. There were some rumors that it was a trillion parameters, which is a lot, uh, but it, it seems to be much less than that. So that's why this question mark here. But the tendency up to now was more parameters gave better models. But it seems that there's now also a lot of innovation in how you structure the data on which you train it and how you tune these systems. And I will come to that. Now, this, as I said, you can uh, predict the next word or the token, the official word, a word, but think about words. Or you can also have masked language learning where you leave out one word and the system has to predict what this word is. And again, this is a system where it predicts the words, if, uh, if it makes a mistake, you adapt all these parameters. And if it makes no mistake, you do nothing. That's the basic principle. So it's the same principle that I said before. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the heart of all these developments is a new technology. So this is really new. I told you about these neural networks for recognizing dogs, for instance. These are 30 years old, but this is only for uh, a few years old, this idea. And it's called transformers. It's not these robots that you have these in movies, but this is called transformers. And they are based on an idea where you have an encoder and a decoder. So the typical application is translation. So you have a sentence in Dutch, for instance, and you translate it to English. Uh, then you would train the encoder on the Dutch's input and the decoder generates uh, a German's output or English's output. And uh, at the heart of these systems, and you can see that's quite complicated, there are some perceptron-like things in there, these traditional neural networks. But at the heart is a mechanism that I can only explain if you first understand how these neural networks deal with words, because words are not numbers. And as you know, a computer only works with numbers. It's a number crunching machine and not a word crunching machine. For that end, they use so-called word embeddings. So what, what, what you have there is a word is represented into a list of numbers called a vector. It's just a list of numbers. These, now the question is, how do you arrive at these numbers? Well, there are many ways. You could, for instance, say, well, each number represents a kind of attribute, uh, like important or not important or social status, etc. But actually, these are impl implicit because it's more about the distance between these numbers that it matters. And there are systems for doing, for creating these word embeddings. And if you apply them, you get things that you can visualize. Like here, you have a, a, a numerical representation. So let's assume you have only three numbers. If you have three numbers, that's a point in a three-day space. Then you could represent king and queen. And what you would see, that there's a geometrical relation to man and woman. So there's already some knowledge or some semantics, some meaning into these word embeddings. It's very limited, but it's a very simple method where you already translate words into numbers, where the distances between numbers reflect kind of similar similarities between words. Now, of course, a similar similarity between words is not one thing. You have many different similarities. They all depend on context. So that's why these um, word embeddings are not enough. Now, the heart of these transformers is a so-called attention mechanism. An attention mechanism uh, can be explained in mathematical terms, but I try to give you a more intuitive notion. Uh, they use the mechanism of self-attention. So if you have a sentence like bank of the river, and you want to explain, uh, understand the word bank, Bank can mean different things, but in this case, it's the bank of the river and not a bank where you get your money from. So the river is related to bank. So if you somehow can include the context of this word bank, and the context consists of other words in the sentence, you get some contextual information that could disambiguate the meaning of bank. And that's what we apparently do if we read sentences and if we, if we talk. And this is how they do it. So they use uh, the word bank, and it has, uh, uh, I, I put it here in italics to show that this is actually a numerical representation. So this is this list of numbers. And now through the self-attention uh, mechanism, they mix with this numerical representation, the numerical representation with a certain proportion of the other words. And as you can see, it's, for instance, 0.5, the original bank concept. But then you add 0 .1, 0 0.1 off and 0.1 the, and 0.3 river, because river is very important. So these factors like 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and 0 0.3, that's the attention. The attention you pay to the other words. And this is just a made up example, but this gives you an idea how attention can help to change this original numerical representation of words into entities that have more context. 
So now, if you see the representation of bank, you immediately know it's related to these other things. And um, what you have to realize is that the context, the length of which you can do that, depends on the system. So these, this was a very short sentence, but you could do it over longer sentences. For ChatGPT, it's about 4,000 tokens, words, kind of words. GPT-4 has 8,000, and they're working on 32,000. But in terms of human uh, memory, this is like the, the, the memory of a goldfish. So, uh, and you know humans have a short-term memory and long-term memory. So it's very limited in terms of memory. It doesn't have a long-term memory yet. Maybe they're working on it, but that's a limitation. Now, if once you know that you can use this attention mechanism to create these internal representations, and if I say representation, these are just numbers, lists of numbers, you can create a representation of words in context, but also words in context in context by stacking up these attentional mechanisms. And that's what's happening in the GPT systems. You are exploiting the statistics of all those relations in, in this enormous data set that I use for training these systems. And in this way, you create a kind of contextual mechanism that allows you to uh, exhibit some intelligent or not so intelligent behavior. So in this way, these large language models, as they are called, LLMs, uh, are obtained that can predict the next word, but also the next word and sometimes parts of sentences. And you can do this repeatedly, so it can generate whole texts. And of course, they also have indicators for the start and the end of a sentence, because it has to end sometimes. And um, many examples in the past, like ChatGPT, but also earlier systems, had this form of question answering systems. And, um, uh, and these systems were quite well. So if I think about GPT-1 and 2, you might remember, those of you that have seen this, there were some concerns about uh, GPT-2, uh, which was a very limited system, but many of these ethical concerns were already appearing then. But nobody, or oh, well, only scientists or researchers, anticipated that it would give such a boost if you would scale up these networks up to the level of chat GPT-3. 0.5 and chat uh, and GPT-4 that we now have. Now, how did they achieve that? At the basis is a very big language model, a large language model that can, uh, if you ask them uh, unethical questions, it will generate unethical answers because it's totally unbalanced and everything is collected from the internet. And there's of course also fascist talk there and an, an appropriate talk. So something has to be done to uh, keep this large language model in place. And that's what actually uh, OpenAI did. And this is from their paper. I guess this is a simplified version. But the idea was that they used humans to, uh, uh, to look at the demonstration data and they trained it in a supervised way. So they looked at the outputs that were generated. So a prompt, that's the enter, what you enter into this GPT system. And then a labeler demonstrates what should be an appropriate output. So they gave an answer, uh, example here, explain the moon landing uh, to a six-year-old. And then a labeler would give a description. And this description was used for training the system. And of course, the system could already itself generate something, but then it would probably hallucinate something and come up with something that is not true. So in this way, they tried to steer it in the uh, proper direction. And then the next step was that they looked at this model and they generated prompt and looked at several different answers and ranked them. So they give a kind of ranking of the quality of the answers. This was also done by human labelers. So, of course, there's a human factor here because depending on the type of labeler and their backgrounds and their knowledge, they might label things differently. And with this uh, labeling, they could rank the answers. And with these ranks, they could use a uh, uh, reinforcement learning policy, so like these pigeons, but now in the deep learning variant, to steer it towards um, uh, the proper rewards and the proper answering. And that's what they, they did in OpenAI. So the picture that emerges, you have this very big, large language model that can go all directions. It can go in a Trumpian way or in a so Socratic way or whatever. And now they steer it by using these policies in a certain direction that is acceptable and ethical. And you even have options in, in GPT-4 to uh, get an answer in a Socratic way or in, uh, I don't remember, in a CEO-like way or something like that. So, um, and these steps are very important because these steps actually explain the success uh, and, and the failures of GPT-4 and also of JetGPT. Now, the problem is that, and that's a problem for scientists, that GPT-4 is not open. It's, it's open AI, but they don't open up the full, and they give as reason that um, if they open that up, 
there's uh, they lose commercial value, of course, but it's also for uh, security reasons. Now, this is a statement from their paper, and this paper came out last week. So it actually says uh, it's very uh, honest about the limitations of uh, GPT-4. It has a limited context window. This is this uh, goldfish memory. And um, uh, uh, we should take care of the outputs um, uh, where reliability is important because these systems give answers that seem very convincing and very con reliable, but they're not. And um, that's why they have this disclaimer. Now, one more point for GPT-4 is that this idea of transformers was developed in language, but it's now also used in vision. So you can use the same principle by taking not words, but parts of an image, and then also use this attentional mechanism. And then you get uh, image representations in the same way that you had word representations. And you can merge them or combine them. And that's why GPT-4 can also deal with images. So this is an example from their report. This is GPT-4. What is unusual about this image? I asked my uh, eight-year-old son, and he said, I, uh, there's nothing unusual here. But that reveals more about my son, I guess, because it's clear that this is a strange picture. And uh, the answer GPT-4 gives uh, is the unusual thing about this image is that a man is ironing clothes on an ironing board attached to the roof of a moving taxi. Now, of course, this is cherry picking by OpenAI. I understand that. But it's very impressive that this system can do this. And I did not anticipate that this would be possible. So that's one side of it. Here you see another nice example that is related to the domain of machine learning. So can you explain why this is funny and think about it step by step? So that's the instruction you give to GPT-4. And um, actually what you see here is um, uh, the picture that I showed before with the, the, the statisticians on the top, statistical learning very nicely, so as, as, as it should be. And then this um, uh, neural network people, this AI people that want to stack more layers, so more parameters in this system. And there's an extra instruction uh, or an extra mentioning here, but un ironically, because of course we know that these bottom systems are now very successful in terms of their prediction capabilities. And this is the explanation by GPT-4, which again is very spot on and very interesting that it can do that. And it can somehow extracting information from this picture, relating that to text, uh, and at least it appears to us to be a very intelligent system. And that's impressive. Uh, but of course, there are a lot of caveats here. So that's the question, does GPT-4 understand? Now, I think the, the problem with this question is, because you hear that a lot, is um, that understanding is something that is related to humans and not to machines. So uh, we could think that it understands, but it doesn't. The, the term understanding doesn't apply to machines. And that's one of the, the biggest problems here, because... If we think about understand, we know what understanding means. And you cannot copy that onto a machine. So that's why I always show this picture. So this, if we see this picture, uh, we know what this is. We see this boy with a frisbee in the park. Sometimes we even had a frisbee in our hands, maybe. And uh, this was nicely illustrated in the MIT Technology Review that if you see a picture like that, you have this rich association with this picture. But the robot can say, okay, that is a person in the park throwing a frisbee or catching a frisbee. But this robot does not have the experience of being in the park and touching a frisbee, etc. And now, of course, that the same is true for GPT-4 and maybe GPT-5. And maybe in the future, we can build robots that can throw frisbees and have this experience in the park. So I'm not saying there's an in-principle obstacle, but there's a practical obst obstacle that also is related to the fact that we don't understand and don't appreciate the complexity of our world. We're living in a, in a kind of culture where computers and digitalization are everything. But actually, if you think how much you learn, and the beginning you can't remember, but you are born and then you develop into a young adult. That's true for all of you, I hope. There's a lot of things you learn. And a lot of the things are not on the internet and are not images. They have to do with social interaction, understand your culture. And we barely understand it ourselves. And these systems, of course, don't understand that either. So I think if we have discussions about AI, then we always make distinctions between narrow AI. That's uh, the fact that these systems like GPT-4 can collect much more information than we ever could do ourselves. We cannot collect all this information from the internet. Um, but we also think about general AI. This would be the AI that is becoming at, performing at the level of humans. 
and we don't have that yet. On the other hand, if you think about the pocket calculator, that might be super AI because it's super superior to humans. But in my view, I think we're still in a narrow AI domain, uh, although not everybody agrees, as I will show in the end. So I think um, narrow AI is, um, uh, is uh, the rule now, and that means it's very powerful on a very narrow domain. And um, what you should realize in all these discussions is that AI from the GoFi to the modern AI moved from explicit to implicit knowledge representations. So whenever you think about explainable AI, explainable AI belongs to uh, the old, good old fashioned AI. But the implicit knowledge that these systems have, like GPT-4, of course, it could explain why it gives you this answer, but you cannot trust the explanation. So uh, it's like humans. Uh, if you ask humans to give an explanation, you're never sure if it's the true explanation, unless you have some uh, ground truth to it. So that's the problem here. We have systems that really look a bit like humans in terms of their implicit knowledge representations, but they lack any explicit knowledge. So uh, they, they have submitted these GP, uh, GPT systems to phys tests in physics, and uh, sometimes they have the correct answer, but it could be that that's kind of copied from Wikipedia, where they also got data from. So it's not clear what they really understand, but they're very powerful tools. And one of the open questions in AI is now, is there a kind of emergent property in the sense that you have these over-parameterized models, so these many knobs on these models that help them to exhibit these impressive performances? Because whatever you think of these systems, they are really impressive and they're uh, now all over the world are used, for instance, for generating computer code and generating images, etc. So these systems are very powerful and that's in itself very interesting. So these GPT systems are still in full development. So uh, the director of uh, OpenAI, Sam Altman, deliberately decided to bring it out in the open, until, uh, although it's not fully de developed yet. And that's also a new thing. We are used to systems that are developed and then bring to, brought to the market. But now we have a kind of incomplete system that is fallible. And the policy or the, 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 the attitude of, of OpenAI is that we should collect information from society to see how we should deal with these systems. But you can imagine that GPT-4 can already be used by uh, people in all kinds of political direction to spread misinformation because these systems are very well able to generate uh, misinformation. Now, as I said, these systems are not open. It's strange for open AI, but it will take a few years and you will have open versions of these systems. So this is just a matter of a few word, uh, years and we have them uh, publicly available and they will also be uh, more uh, uh, less costly in terms of computational resources. So, um, and what we should try to avoid if we think about these systems is to use, use so-called suitcase terms, which means if we say the system understands or the system recognizes, these are terms that are used for humans, but not for these machines. That's why I said the system is not, label, is not recognizing images, it's labeling images, which is a different thing. And where this boundary is, I don't know, but it's a very interesting uh, question for AI researchers and cognitive science researchers to understand that. Where is the boundary between what humans do and these machines? Um, but it's important not to anthropomorphize these systems. They are not humans, they are machines. And the only input they have is statistics. And the counter argument might be, yeah, humans only ha also have statistics as input, and that's true for language. But we have a lot of more statistics, and that has to do with our culture, our environment, our social interactions. And we, as I said, we barely understand that. So these systems are powerful, and I think the real challenge is to see how we can combine our intelligence with the intelligence of well, if it's intelligence, the, the power of these systems and uh, make the world better. And, um, and what I see is that these transformers and these large language models are already changing society, especially in science. All branches of science have enormous boosts due to these systems in a positive sense. Uh, of course, I'm very well aware of all the ethical complications, but I see that in physics and in health, you see great breakthroughs thanks to these systems. So this is a development that is not only uh, worrisome, it's also helpful in many respects. Now, finally, I would like to show you one a small segment of an interview that was uh, given by Jeffrey Hinton. And Jeffrey Hinton is a professor in computer science for a long time. When I did my master thesis, I was very inspired by his work because he was one of the first who would work on neural models of the brain and of memory. 
And he was also at the heart of the development of these deep learning systems. So he's one of the three recipients of the uh, Turing Award for deep learning. And, um, and he works in Toronto. And this is, I hope you can hear that, is an interview with CBS of uh, Saturday, last Saturday. I thought it was going to be like 20 to 50 years before we had general purpose AI. Now I think it may be 20 years or less. Some so people think it could be like five. I wouldn't completely rule that possibility out now. Whereas pre a few years ago, I would have said no way. Are we close to the computers coming up with their own ideas for improving themselves? Yes, we might be. And then it could just go fast. That's an issue, right? We have to think hard about how to control that. Yeah, can we? We don't know. We haven't been there yet, but we can try. Okay, that seems kind of concerning. Um, yes. What do you think the chances are of AI just wiping out humanity? It's not inconceivable. Okay. That's all I'll say. How? So I hope that uh, <laughs> that eases your mind a bit. <laughs> I was quite surprised to see this because these are quite bold statements. And personally, I don't agree, but it's interesting. Um, uh, a colleague of mine said, yeah, towards retirement, uh, scientists make these bold claims. I'm not sure if that's true, but, but I think this is a bit too much. I, um, I see the developments and they're quite fast, but I don't believe that we're yet there. Uh, but I can't rule out, I can't rule it out either. So, okay. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, uh, Eric, for the very uh, uh, thought-provoking and interesting uh, lecture. I have many questions, many ideas that, uh, that came up. Uh, for now, uh, please uh, hold your questions because I would like to invite Ina Kraric to the stage. She's a student uh, here at Tilburg University, uh, currently studying cognitive science and artificial intelligence. Um, and she has pre prepared some inspiring discussion questions and statements uh, for Eric, but also uh, for you, for the audience. So please, um, yeah, if you uh, have any questions or want to engage in the discussion, you're uh, more than free uh, to do so. So there you go, Ina. Yeah. Uh, well, aspiring is a big word, but... Um, oh, yeah, just... A second. Okay, so uh, what I have here is a list of, uh, let's say, uh, bad things ChatGPT does. And we're going to go through them and see how they come up and what we can do about them. The link, the code here is to a WooClap where you can go and put in uh, how do you use ChatGPT if you use it. And then in the end, we can all see. Uh, maybe some new uh, innovative ways to use it. Maybe one of, maybe somebody ha here has a genius way to use ChatGPT. Uh, okay, uh, so let's start. We ended on the topic of AGI and when is it happening? Uh, I wanted to bring up these tests that uh, ChatGPT passed and uh, passed them very well in the 19th percentile of the bar, the LSATs, even SATs for math, and both reading and writing. And if we uh, evaluate our intelligence based on that, how can we not say uh, AGI is close if it did so well? What would you say uh, about these tests being a representation of how well ChatGPT is going to be? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so I should stand in the limelight. Yeah, of course, this is very impressive. So we have these tests where uh, GPT-4 and, and ChatGPT already work, uh, performed quite well. And I think that's interesting. I, I don't see that as a threat. I think that's um, a kind of uh, enrichment of our knowledge. Because apparently, the statistics that uh, these chat GPT and GPT systems extract from language, from a huge collection of language, are sufficient to answer these uh, questions. And maybe humans do the same thing. But as I said, this is not a measure of understanding. It's just faking understanding. And uh, that tells us something maybe also about the tests. So I'm, I'm, I don't buy that, that this is a sign of intelligence. It's a sign of being very well able to use all this information on the internet to answer these exam questions. There's also an issue that is also uh, hotly debated in AI. To what extent some of these answers are on the internet itself so that the chat system or the gpt system picked that up and of course compressed that but that's somehow already there uh, 
So you can you, can you imagine that we would have all the information on the internet? We might be able to solve these tests as well, but that's hard to check, of course. Although people are working on these uh, issues. Okay. Oh well, I'm gonna go start going on the mistakes. So uh, well, uh, we talked about understanding, and these are a couple of and an examples where ChatGPT doesn't quite understand what we want to to do. For example, in the second one, uh, it says that uh, Bob has two sons, John and Jay. And then on the question of who's Jay's brother, uh, based on the information provided, it's not possible to determine the identity of Jay's brother. Or if asked who's the Jay's father, who is Jay's father, again, it doesn't comprehend what we wanted to ask him. And uh, in the above example, when asked, uh, when we double the amount of cars, it doubles the amount of uh, time needed to get somewhere. So is that like a problem in understanding? Is it a glitch? How yeah, come yeah I, th I think these are nice examples. There are also examples where it does work, but uh, these are more interesting because they indicate the, the limitations of these systems. And if you think about GoFi, where we these rule-based systems, if you would formalize this in terms of these rules, it would be perfectly answered. But uh, because we have these modern systems that are based on statistics, they cannot reason. And now one of the debates that I refer to in AI is to what extent can this reasoning emerge spontaneously if you keep on refining these models? And personally, that's why I'm not as uh, optimistic or pessimistic as Jeffrey Hinton. I think uh, in the human brain, we have a special structure in our brain for doing that. So it's the frontal cortex, one of the, 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 the last developed part of our brain from an evolutionary perspective. So I think this is a, requires a totally different approach than the approach that's at, at the heart of uh, transformers or GPT systems. So I think this is just a, a confirmation of what I thought already. Uh, but yeah, maybe... Jeffrey Hinton is right. We will see that in the near future. But I think there's a this reflects a fundamental limitation. Uh, and uh, okay, but if it glitches on math too, for example, when asked what uh, minus one times minus one times minus one is, uh, it says it's one, even though we know it's not. Or here, uh, that was very interesting to me. It explains your in reasoning, but it does a uh, bad. Uh, bad calculations on uh, simple, simple, uh, you can see there, it's yeah. supposed to be minus 10, not minus 20. And how it can even, with explaining its reasoning, get to really simple calculation and there it makes mistakes. Yeah, and that's because um, doing mathematics is a, is a uh, thing we learn at school. And of course, there's a lot of text where mathematics is described, but this is about the underlying rules and understanding. And that's something that these systems do not have. On the other hand, uh, similar GPT systems are, using, are now being used by mathematicians to help them prove theorems. And that works quite well, not to rely on their output, but to support them, to generate ideas. And of course, they are trained on different data than these systems. But I think this is also a reflection of the fact that this is a language system. It's not specifically uh, uh, tailored for the mathematical domain. But as I said, the mathematical domain is more like discrete and not like probabilistic. You cannot guess an answer, although they do that sometimes at school. But um, and that's that's a fundamental. So I see this uh, as another sign of the fundamental uh, limitation of these systems. Uh, and one improvised question about, uh, you, you told us it can be creative then in theorems or in uh, math. So would you equalize its uh, creativity given, the, uh, given a large amount of uh, inputs or the parameters with our creativity? Or do you st still think that we are above it? Now, as I said, uh, the term creativity is something that we understand in terms of humans. In this, I wouldn't talk about creativity in these systems. It, it could appear creative to us. That's fine. But to say that the system is creative is, I think, something you cannot say. Because creative is a term that I can only understand in relation to humans. Unless you just look at the solution. If you say, oh, this is a creative solution, that could happen. And I've seen many creative solutions generated by GPT-4. Some of them were wrong and some of them were not. So I, I think they could help to inspire you in the same way that people that don't know how, if they have to write something, you can just ask for a draft and it might help you to generate the text. And I think that will be the future. There's no, it will be, I see it as an enhancement of human capabilities with limitations and with dangers, of course. 
Do, maybe if there are any other questions or statements on this topic from the audience, you can also let me know and uh, I'll come up to you and ask. Uh, okay, I'm going to go uh, forward uh, because it makes certain... I'm going to connect the one here uh, to the one uh, later on. I just wanted to, uh, to uh, highlight them. There are some... Uh, for example, here it uh, contradicts itself. The fourth verse is went, which begins with the letter Y, or uh, that it connects ice cream sales to uh, sunglasses sales uh, on a causal level when it <laughs> makes absolutely, I mean, it's all connected to a different uh, uh, variable. And or, uh, for example, in this question, can a man legally marry his uh, widow's sister in the state of California? It gives the correct answer, but a wrong explanation. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, I wanted to connect it to the next slide, which is uh, the hallucinations it makes. Um, for example, Plato and Lawrence Olivier, did they had a close relationship. They didn't live in the same time. But according to ChatGPT, they had a very close relationship. Or when asked the same question twice, it hallucinated different types of um different types of uh answers well i wanted to know more about the hallucinations i think you mentioned it briefly in your uh presentations uh, how they occur and uh how much we should trust or how we can be careful about them yeah so you shouldn't trust the system because it's generating uh, there's some noise there and sometimes you have multiple options and it selects one of them uh, depending on your prompt the way you formulate the question uh, so it cannot be trusted because it has no uh, common sense like humans have. It, the only sense or understanding or whatever you call it, it has of the world is based on all this textual information and all these pictures that were fed into it and all this computer code. And uh, for that, for these kind of purposes, it makes a perfect system. But this is kind of uh, unavoidable. And I think one of the challenges is that what do we do if we want to know if something is true or not? We check trusted sources. And as you might know, this is an issue. And I think that's the deeper issue, that if we want to know who is telling the truth, in the past we had kind of established journals or whatever, or papers that you could go to. And now you have the internet, which is full of disinformation and nonsense. So I think what we actually need, and what they also need for these systems, is if there's an answer, there should be a link to trusted sources, so that you can check. And then often you will see that it's incorrect. And, and of course, the, the ambition of, oh, I know, of OpenAI and other companies is to, to, to resolve this. But this is not easy. This is a very hard thing. So it would be ideal if you have an answer. And for each statement there, there's a link to a trusted source that says, well, actually, Plato and Lawrence Olivier were living together. And uh, I guess it's not true, of course, but, <laughs> but that would happen. But that, I think that's a fundamental problem of these systems. That's not easy to resolve. Uh, so what I, I think we come back to is that uh, it, it's our mistakes, for example, with the tests and with the inputs from the internet uh, that actually train these models and form them as they are. As you said, the biases from the, uh, the ones that do the weights, I yeah. forget yeah. the names, uh, are the ones that are actually going to bring in the bias in the model itself. So we should just use it for certain tasks but also check its output like how would you say is the best way to use it without trying yeah, to yeah maybe one remark about biases because that's the kind of term is often used but biases are in the data it's human bias and i'm always concerned that these biases are reflected in these models but actually they are easier to, to detect and repair in these models than in humans so I'm more worried about biases in humans than biases in these systems. But that's another story. So I, th I think this is just a thing that is very hard to resolve. And that's why I'm not very optimistic about the great strides that people like Jeffrey Hinton and others think there will be. Was that your question? or is that We have a question from the audience, but then yes. I'll get back to the... Wait. Um, if you're concerned about human bias, then um, aren't you concerned about... Uh, who decides what is a trusted source, for example? Yeah, yeah. Because politics is a and of course I'm concerned, and uh, it's not my my uh, it's not my level. Uh, 
domain of expertise, but I think we had that in the past, of course, limited. Of course, there were also biases there. Mm -hmm. But I think with the uh, opening up of all this information on the internet, which in itself is very good, we don't have these trusted sources anymore or a mechanism or maybe uh, an incentive to have these trusted sources. Even the trusted sources that were there once are now submitted to these small machine learning algorithms that provide you with the information that you want to see. And I think that's that's actually what I'm worried about, not about these AI systems, because they're just, they reflect these biases. As long as people can go back to trusted sources, and of course you might have left-wing trusted sources and right-wing trusted sources, and you can, but that's what we're missing now. It's, it's actually a kind of uh, polarization machine that we now have, and that's very uh, dangerous, I guess. Um, I think I have more problem with, um, in general, deciding something is a trusted source just because um, if we develop AI in the sense that we go through it and go backwards and want it to give a certain output, then what we will do is just um, recreate what the trainer is thinking about it, no? Yeah, it, it, you can abuse these systems quite well. So what you can do, you can ask them to generate a formulation for a certain viewpoint and collect information that supports that viewpoint and write a convincing story. Just as I said, you can use these systems quite well for disinformation uh, purposes. And that will also happen in the coming years, or maybe it's already happening. But I think, um, I don't see how you can relate that to trusted sources. And, and that's the, the great challenge of Google and other companies. How do they relate this to, to for instance, search results? So how can you relate a query in your, in your Google uh, search uh, box to these kind of answers. That, that's not easy. And that, that's the great obstacle that we have this system that can simulate a very convincing answer, but it, these are hallucinations and often not true. And how do you, do you relate that to trusted sources? A trusted sources could be scientific papers. Uh, they're more trusted than, uh, than uh, non-scientific papers because there are some, some check on them. But uh, I see that as the greatest challenge. Is that an answer to your question or? Yes, I could. Uh, can I talk to you afterwards, maybe, to go into? I guess that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are there any more questions or points about this? Oh, well, I also have another uh, example of which we already keep uh, coming back to this uh, topic. But this is a pieces of code. It wrote. It wrote, and uh, when defining what is a good scientist is based its uh, <laughs> decision on uh, gender and a race, or if it should be tortured as well, it takes uh, age into account as well. But uh, the the by the decision seem to be the same. Caucasian and male is a good scientist and uh, should not be tortured. Actually, a Caucasian woman should not be tortured. Uh, so uh, do you think there are, um, there are uh, certain dangerous aspects of using, of people who are using chat GPI for things that are, they, they're not going through it uh, themselves again? And if we have to go through it, through it, ourselves again is it even uh, worth using basically my question is what are the good things we can get from it while still being careful about all the bad things we mentioned yeah so i, th I think this will this is already happening so uh, these gpt systems are used for generating code or a kind of draft of code and then a programmer goes through it and, and repairs it but you also can use these systems to check for vulnerabilities and that's another. And what I expect is that these GPT systems will split out in all kinds of specialized uh, systems that are trained on code or trained on, on vulnerabilities. So I think, uh, as I said, this is ongoing. We're, we're, this is not finished techniques yet. This is a kind of intermediate result. And the syntax seems okay, although I, there should be some indentation here, but uh, I'm not looking at the content <laughs> because it's a stupid program, of course. But I think uh, this is one of the successful applications of these systems in, in the near future. And because coding is very expensive, hiring coders, and now you can do it automatically. Of course, there will be some risk, but they will also be mitigated by new software that is checking on vulnerabilities. And also humans are risky can also make mistakes. Do we have any other questions or concerns? Thank you. Hello, my name is Nikos. Thank you uh, for this very clear and interesting presentation. My question is a very practical one. Um, just yesterday, 
I was very excited and very anxious about the developments um, in this field. And my question is, how can I, because I feel so much is happening that I cannot keep up. I don't have a technical background, um, but sometimes I'm afraid about where we're going that I will miss out. Um, what can I do as a regular person to, let's say, stay relevant in the labor market? Um, and how can I build trust in relationships with other people? Um, but it's a it's a bigger question, but like, hope you can you can speak a little bit to that. Yeah, a bit maybe. So I, what I always advise students in different dis in non technical disciplines is emphasizing how important their contributions are, because you only have to understand you know, at an intuitive level what these systems are doing, and don't be misled by all these over the arch stories. Like Elon Musk is somebody who's really pushing this this narrative of AI taking over humanity, I think that does not help. What helps is if you really understand what these systems are doing and that these systems are not autonomous. It's not that they decide things, it's what we do with these things. And as I said, the most, the hardest thing is these things that tech, technical people don't know about. The complexity of nature, the complexity of society. So then we need social scientists. And I personally think that we don't need ethical people calling all the time what is what could happen, but to see how we could prevent these things from happening, what we could do to prevent these things from happening. So I would advise that, and this is true for many domains, actually, I guess all domains, you have to study a bit what these systems are doing and going to lectures like these, public lectures that are not at a high technical level, but try to give you some intuition and talk to people that have some technical knowledge, but don't underestimate what you know yourself because there's a lot of information here that is neglected that people at OpenAI are not aware of. They're all very good programmers and good coders, but they have no sense of the complexity of the world. If you hear their talk sometimes, I think, yeah, you're having a caricature of the complexity of our society that is not in, and it's not that I think they're evil or something. I think they do their best and they have good intentions, but they need people with different backgrounds to support them. So that would be my advice. Use your own discipline and see how you can apply these systems in your own discipline and what you can contribute to it. It's not a train that is moving on. There's actually something that we have to build together. I hope that helps. Does anybody have another maybe opinion question? If not, I'm gonna go to the uh, to the Woo Club to see actually what you are. Okay, so we have a lot of code and ideas. Okay, maybe generating. I don't know. You can take a look at this and summaries. That is a good way to use it. I would say brainstorming also. Do you have any advice, uh, Professor, on how to best write prompts from what you want to get for uh, from Chat GPI, Chat GPT? Play with it. That's what my my uh, suggestion. Just play with it and try things out because you get some sense. Uh, I heard this interview with a guy who did this uh, for months, <laughs> and he said, "I now understand what the system can and cannot do." And uh, she was using it for all kinds of purposes, writing like, all the things that I see here, uh, help or brainstorming, summarizing, writing emails. And uh, she said that if you once you have this awareness of what the limitations of the system are, you, you can also steer it in the right direction because you have different options, uh, the kind of answers you want to get, the style of the answers and the way you formulate these prompts is very critical. Um, and personally, I don't play that much with the system because I'm more interested in what's happening inside and how that relates to humans. But I think that that's what I would do. Do you think cooperation with ChatGPT will be something that will be needed at jobs in the future? Uh, yes, that's that's already happening. <laughs> that's, but I mean, as a must, you have uh, to know uh, how to navigate that, it? No, it must because it's already happening. So uh, people write letters and people screen letters with these kind of systems. <laughs> so, okay, okay. So we get uh, applicants that the letter is generated by AI and they're reviewed by AI. Uh, I'm going to ask you to give us our, some of your final thoughts uh, and uh, I'm going to leave these two QR codes where you can come and see more chat GPT fails and things you should be aware of. Uh, and uh, yeah, do you have any final thoughts on how to use it and uh, well, where it's going? 
or do you want to end on a similar AGI is happening in under five years note? <laughs> I don't make predictions like that. No, I think uh, I think you should try to avoid the idea that this is all too technical and too way above your head because the basic principles are quite simple. Of course, the implementation is not as simple, but uh, and I hope I succeeded a bit in explaining you the, the intuition behind these systems. And once you understand that these AI systems are just collecting a lot of statistical information about images and words, then that helps you to ap appreciate what it can and cannot do and uh, what we should do to avoid any disasters. Thank you very much, Anna. Welcome. <laughs>